It's a pleasure to have uh, Bishira Bozen Mapo and uh, Wendy McKay here. And they, they both uh, are leaders in the field and uh, pioneers uh, in the field of uh, human computer interaction. Um, so, Michel, uh, our speaker today, and uh, he's a professor at the University of uh, Paris. Right. And so, he's going to talk about uh, their recent work on large screen multi surface interaction. Um, it's very exciting to see this project. Uh, so, the project is not only to design new interaction techniques, but also to redesign computing architectures to provide better support for new form factors and uh, uh, interaction techniques. So, sure. Thank you, Yang. So, uh, thank you really for being here. As uh, Yang said, I'm, I'm from Université Paris-Sud in France. And this year, uh, together with Wendy, we're both visiting professors at Stanford actually thinking of spending a second year there. Um, before I start the talk, I would like to uh, give you one slide on, on what we do in, in the lab in Paris called uh, in situ for uh, situated interaction. In French, it's interaction située. Uh, so the group is headed by Wendy. And we work on all sorts of things. Uh, today, um, what I will talk about falls under the first and last categories in here, mostly interaction and visualization paradigms. We try to create new interaction techniques and, and visualization techniques for all sorts of environments from kids to the office to uh, interactive rooms uh, as I will talk about today. Uh, and the last uh, one is engineering of interactive systems. We try to build uh, toolkits and, and uh, software that sometimes gets distributed to put our ideas into practice and also to have tools to, to develop our own research. The second theme is mediated communication which I will uh, not talk very much uh, or not at all today, but we've done and still do a lot of work on helping people communicate, especially uh, in what we call the intimate social network, so the like of uh, like anti-Facebook, if you wish, kind of thing, where you want to have uh, channels of communication with your really close, real friends and family. Uh, and participatory design, which crosses uh, across all these uh, uh, topics, where we engage with real users who have real problems to inform our design process and involve them in the design process all along from, from early uh, 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 requirements discovery to prototyping to evaluation to redesign. So uh, go see our website, uh, institute.lri.fr, to, to see what, uh, what we're doing. So to open the talk today, I pulled this image from uh, Mark Weiser's uh, you know, visionary paper in 1991. It's been 20 years. Uh, that the paper has been published on, on the, uh, the, the concept of UbiComp. And this is a sentence from the opening uh, uh, paragraph of the paper. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indis indistinguishable from it. And the question we can ask is 20 years later, have we achieved this uh, weaving of technology into our everyday life? Uh, I think not. Maybe for you here, Yes, because you're, you are at Google, so you're in a high-tech environment. But for the rest of us, uh, maybe not so much. We have all sorts of hardware, as uh, Wiser in, uh, envisioned, all sorts of sizes and, and shapes of devices, although, interestingly, things like tablets are very, very recent. But when you go to the software level, uh, things are not really well integrated. Uh, why do I have to plug in my iPhone to sync? Why, why do I have to sync? What does it mean to sync an iPhone? Um, if I were to share this presentation with you, not like sending you the slides in advance, but you know, as I show these slides, letting you uh, uh, have them on your laptop so you can annotate or do whatever you want with them, uh, or if at the end, if you have a question and you want to flip to go to the slide where you have the, the question, there's no easy way to do this today. Uh, we know it's technically feasible, but the infrastructure uh, has not been available to do this. And you know, it took much less than 20 years for the GUI paradigm to go from the Alto or the Xerox star to, to, to mainstream, but for UbiComp, it's still not there. And this is even more true at the interaction level. Uh, Rikimoto showed this uh, pick and drop interaction technique, uh, which is extremely natural and intuitive uh, 15 years ago, almost 14 years ago. Uh, but we still don't have it today. I mean, I know there are apps that do you know, bumping and things like this. So 
it, it's sort of in the air, but again, we don't have the uh, underlying infrastructure to make this happen sort of uh, routinely in our use of computers. So I think we're far from having really uh, put the, the Ubicom vision of Mark Weiser uh, into reality. So interaction Ubicom can take many forms. And here, arguably, I'm going to concentrate on one uh, part of Ubicom, uh, which, which is not the whole story. Uh, Ubicom oftentimes is seen as you know, millions of people with mobile devices and uh, uh, running around in the streets. Uh, here, I'm going to concentrate on what I call interactive rooms which is part of that, of that grand vision. I think in this type of environment like we have today with a bunch of people around the room with uh, shared displays, um, the problem is we don't support multi-device interaction. We don't support collaborative interaction very well. And we don't support situated interaction. So um, I think the reason for this is not the lack of research. There has been a lot of research in all these topics. But sort of getting to the next step of, of going from this, what I often call point designs, like the pick and drop, very nice example, uh, to architectures, models, and tools that then pave the way to turn this into uh, software that everybody uses. So uh, how can we have uh, a way to interact in this types of environment more seamlessly than we do it today. How can we do it in a way that is not just putting uh, graphical user interfaces on, uh, on every laptop or, or PDA or, or smartphone, uh, but something that is more uh, uh, usable by real humans? So if you look at this, uh, this graphic designer here, uh, he's working on a table. And you can see he has all sorts of tools. He's using a pen. Uh, I actually don't know all the words of these things in English. The, the ruler. Um, and um, you see there's a mug there. So the mug, it's suspici suspiciously clean. Uh, so I don't know if he's using it to drink coffee or tea, but maybe he's using it to put pens in there, or maybe he's using it to draw circles. Uh, the point here is that he has a lot of simple tools at his disposal to do fairly highly complex tasks, tasks which is to, to draw these diagrams. And if you look a bit further, his environment also has documents in front of him on this board. Uh, and there are stacks and, and books on, on, this, on this desk. So here we see someone who is highly skilled and uses fairly simple tools to do complex things. Now, when I was putting this slide together, this is what my desktop looked like. Um, and here, first of all, I have most of the space taken over by the tools. These tools are fairly complex to do fairly simple mundane tasks, like you know, picking a color or picking a font. And so on the computer, we tend to have a situation where we have complex tools, and we only do simple things, things with them. Here, I was not trying to do much with that image. I was just trying to reframe it and, and, and color it and things like this. So I think there's this big contrast between interaction in the real world, where we, are, we easily grab simple tools and put them at work in, in ways that are not always uh, anticipated and the computer where everything is very uh, highly constrained. And in fact, this notion of tools and instruments is something that has uh, uh, really got me interested for a long time. This is a, a few pages from the L'Encyclopédie by, by Diderot and D'Alembert in, uh, in 1751. And this was one of the, of the early encyclopedia. And one of the things it did was to document all the tools that were used by people in the various trades at the time. And so you can probably recognize some of them, some of them uh, probably uh, uh, unusual to you. Interesting thing is, I read recently uh, about someone who studied all these tools, and they're all in use again still today. Uh, so humans have been creating tools for as long as we've been humans. Uh, it's a distinctive trait of, of, the, of, of human species compared to animals. There are a few examples of animals using tools, uh, but humans have been creating tools to uh, mediate their interaction with the environment. <coughs> and I think there is something very interesting about the power of tools, if you put it in, in the context of uh, Gibson's uh, ecological theory. I don't know how many of you are, are, are familiar with uh, Gibson's work, or at least the word affordance, maybe, rings a bell. So 
for Gibson, the notion of an affordance is the fact that the environment offers possibilities for action. And the, he's talking about the animal and humans being one kind of animal. Uh, detect those affordances or seek those affordances in the environment. And so affordances are not properties per se of the environment. They are relationships between the, the subject uh, and the environment. Now, if you think of tools in this context, when I pick up a pen on the table, suddenly it changes the affordances of the environment. Before I have a pen, uh, the affordances for writing are very limited. Well, if I'm on a beach, I can write with my finger on the sand. But if I'm in this room and I have no pen, I, I don't have a tool to write. Once I have a pen environment in, in my hand, sorry, suddenly a bunch of surfaces become writable. I can write on the table. Probably I shouldn't, but that's a different question. Uh, and so tools are a very powerful way to change the affordances of the environment. It also works in, in, the, in the opposite way, where I can seek uh, objects with particular affordances for a particular tasks. So uh, if I'm in the wild and I want to draw on a surface, maybe I can use a charred piece of wood, which you know, will uh, allow me to, to draw. And we all know in the real world that we use tools in ways they weren't intended for. So if uh, I need to drive a nail into a wall and I don't have a hammer, I can use a rock, I can use uh, another metal tool, I can use my shoe, whatever. So I think tools uh, are really a powerful metaphor uh, for interacting with computers. And maybe over the years, the word direct manipulation that we always use when we refer to graphical user interfaces has been taken too literally. Because if you look at GUIs today with menus and dialog boxes and, and palettes and all that, the interaction is, is often, if not always, mediated with the things we interact with, the, the document, the, um, the data or the information we interact with. So um, back in 2000, I published a paper on, on this um, uh, interaction model called instrumental interaction. Uh, to me, the words tool and instruments are, mean the same thing. I like instrument for uh, two reasons. One is from instrument, you can go to instrumental, which you can't with the word tool. Uh, there's no adjective. Uh, but more importantly, I like instrument because it often echoes the notion of musical instrument, the notion of skill, of virtuosity, and the notion of having to learn an instrument to, to get the, the best out of it. So instrumental interaction uh, is a model where interaction is mediated. So if I am to navigate the document because it's bigger than, than the window, I can use a, a scroll bar, which is a, a navigation instrument. But if I'm on a touch surface, maybe I will use another instrument uh, where I, I use flicks to, to navigate the document. Uh, I could imagine other ways. Uh, maybe I could have uh, something, another device on the, on the side of my um, computer to, to, to turn like uh, you do with scrolls in, in, in some cases. So what's important with instruments is that, in general, they reify uh, a command. So the verb navigate or to scroll becomes an object in the interface like a scroll bar. And to the user, that makes it something that is uh, very well easier to discover and fairly natural as, as it parallels some of the things we do in the real world. In addition, instruments can be polymorphic in that a single instrument can apply to various different uh, types of objects. So, for example, if I have uh, something to apply a color, uh, I should use the same instrument to color uh, any type of objects on my, uh, on my screen. So, this combination of reification and polymorphism, the ability to uh, uh, turn an abstract verb into a concrete object, and the ability to have this object or instrument apply to, to a large category of objects gives a great power to this, to this metaphor. Um, and I don't have time today to go into more details about this, but uh, there are several papers that we have published about this, and, and I can talk more if there are questions. So in 2000, we did a proof of concept. It was an application that combined bimodal interaction, marking menus, tool glasses. I think to date, it's the first real application that 
uh, combine all these techniques, which we knew for a long time, but had, had not really been used together. And it was a great success. Uh, they have now over 40 or I think even 60,000 downloads. And this was an application to edit colored picture nets, which you know, not that many people in the world are really interested in doing. So with that many downloads, I think it's a large uh, share of the population of potential users. And it was uh, a great success. But where the thing loops back with Ubicomp is that a couple of years ago, I worked with a Danish uh, student on the notion of ubiquitous instrumental interaction, of saying, well, let's get these instruments out of the applications uh, uh, themselves and really separate them like instruments in the real world. My pen is not attached to my piece of paper. It, I can use it outside the context of, of writing on a on piece of paper. So what if we do the same thing and detach those instruments for, from, from their immediate environment? So we did this system uh, called Vigo, where uh, you could uh, pull a tool palette or a color palette or uh, other things from a shared surface and put it on your um, smartphone at the time. This was a, a Nokia, I think. Uh, and we created this notion of multi-surface interaction. And having instruments that span these multiple surfaces. So in a sense, we didn't much more than recreating things like the pick and drop from Rikimoto, but we put it into a consistent framework where uh, you could imagine other types of interaction and you can make it work uh, in sort of in a more generic way than the, 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 the technique that Rikimoto had introduced. So this gets us to, to the main uh, topic for the talk today, which is the, the wild room. So over the past two years, we have explored this notion of multi-surface interaction in uh, an environment we created uh, at our lab in Paris called the wild room. And wild means uh, wall-sized interaction with large data sets. And for us, this is an example of something I uh, think we don't see enough of in, in HCI research these days, and I call it integrative research. Uh, and to me, the work that went and that led to the Xerox star in, in, in 1981 is a good example of, of what you can achieve with integrative research. Of course, the star was the result of 10 years or more of research at, at, at Xerox Park. But what is important is that they put together a bunch of technologies uh, that they created from the ground up. They created the hardware, uh, including you know, part of the, of the, the CPU and, and really the, the, the guts of the, of the system, uh, and the software, including the operating system, the, op the application software. Uh, they created a specific keyboard. They reinvented or redesigned the mouse, et cetera, et cetera. And by creating everything from scratch, they had tremendous freedom. Uh, also, they had a, a specific target population, which were executive secretaries. And the reason I think we have this top metaphor today is because they were targeting this population, and they created a metaphor that was meaningful for this population. If they are targeted uh, another uh, type of population, probably they would have come up with a different uh, type of, uh, of environment. The point here is that Integrative research is about putting together uh, a set of existing technologies in ways that haven't been done before, discovering the problems that creates, solving those problems, and solving them for a target population because you cannot do everything at once. And so with the WILD uh, platform, uh, we are modestly trying to do the same thing. Uh, we want to study interaction in interactive rooms where you have collections of interactive surfaces. Uh, we have a wall display, uh, interactive table, we have mobile devices, handheld devices, uh, and we can track uh, motion in the environment. And we want to see how we need to redefine interaction in this environment, and we want to create the underlying software to make this run not only in this specific platform, but hopefully in ways that could, could be uh, translated to other similar environments. So I'm going to go quickly uh, uh, to describe the hardware. So we have a wall with 32 monitors, 30-inch uh, monitors. Uh, you have the size here. Uh, here you can in feet, so it would be 18 by 6 feet. Um, the re total resolution is about 130 million pixels. And it's mounted on four carts 
and each screen is itself on, on a, a pivotable structure, I mean, uh, attachment. So we can actually reconfigure this in various ways. It takes time to do it. It's not a push of a button, but uh, it's important uh, to uh, see how better configurations can work. For example, we like this triptych configuration. If it's completely flat, we find that it's hard to, uh, to reuse the wall efficiently because of the, of the parallax. Uh, we decided to have what we call now ultra high resolution uh, uh, with the cost of having this French door effect of the bezels of the screens. The idea is that those bezels will go away one day if there is enough uh, technological push to, to make them disappear. But the benefit of the ultra high resolution is really important. So here is, I'm sorry the, the image is dark, but here is what you would get if this image of the world were displayed with a, a standard projector, uh, sort of like this one. You see the size of the pixels, it's extremely pixelated. This is part of France, right? Now if you go to what people call uh, high or very high resolution, like the, the wall they have at the University of Toronto, which has 16 projectors, the same physical size as ours, but uh, 10 times as fewer pixels, so we have 10 times as many pixels as, as they do, uh, you get a better resolution like this one. And on our wall, you get this type of resolution. And of course, the projector cannot <laughs> display it accurately. So you have to see it for yourself. But imagine the monitor you have on your desk uh, with that resolution on the whole wall. And what that means is then you move and you use the space differently. You don't stay away, away from the wall because as you approach it, you see more detail. So you have this sort of physical, uh, what we call physical pan and zoom, where the thing on the wall doesn't change, but as you move closer, you can see more detail. And of course, uh, as you move backwards, you can see the overview. And that completely changed the, the type of interaction. Now, it's more uh, uh, critical on, on displays like this. This is a map of part of the internet, where I've put a, a close up here, and you see that there are all these labels that are the names of the, of the switches on the internet. And on our wall, we can have this image full screen, full resolution. You can get up close and read all these labels. You don't have to pan and zoom or use lenses or any of this thing. And we think this is, this is really uh, critical for the type of interaction we we're looking at. So we have a multi-touch table. Uh, nothing special about it. It has a much lower resolution than the wall, which uh, is actually interesting and, and draws people kind of away from the table uh, a lot of the time. Uh, we have a motion tracking system using the, the Vicon, uh, the well-known commercial Vicon system. We can track objects and people uh, in the whole room with high accuracy and, and, and no lag. And we use mobile devices, handheld devices. So we've used the iPod Touch a lot, uh, iPhones, iPads. We have Android devices now. We also have something called the gyroscopic mouse, which is a mouse that you can use uh, in, in midair. And we create our own devices when needed. And we found that people really liked to have the, their sort of own personal device to interact in this environment where everything else is, is shared. I'll come back to this in a moment. The wall itself is powered by a 16 uh, computer cluster. We put in you know, everything we could in terms of uh, memory, uh, 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 top end graphics card, uh, because we're not you know, graphics, uh, computer graphics specialists. So we wanted to make it easy for ourselves to create software for this thing. Uh, it's hooked up to a computational cluster, although we haven't used much of this connection so far. But each computer drives two screen. Um, and, um, and that means that every time you want to do anything on, on this wall, you need to create a distributed system that will uh, run on that cluster. So there's no way to, to use standard applications uh, off the shelf. So the key point here, if you compare this to other environments of that sort, a lot of the other environments and, and certainly of the walls we've seen were uh, very large, but didn't focus on interaction. And instead, we are focusing on interaction and collaboration. Uh, the fact that we have this very large size, ultra high resolution, and multiple surfaces, all these together provide unique affordances for interaction in this, in this environment. And we created with uh, off-the-shelf components, which made it really cheap and, and easy to, to reproduce elsewhere. So now our, our um, extreme users. So our users are scientists. Uh, we are in the 
uh, university near Paris that is uh, well known internationally for especially their mathematicians, their physicists, um, and, and also biology. And so we linked with uh, labs that all have problems dealing with data today. So uh, it goes from astrophysics to mechanical engineering, uh, biology, particle physics, etc. Uh, particle physics, for example, they get data straight out of the LHC at CERN, uh, and they haven't figured out how they're going to look at it. They literally don't know how to look at it. Another example is astrophysicists. Uh, this is an astrophysicist from uh, EIS. Uh, and this is the first time you can see this image uh, of the deep uh, sky uh, at full resolution and, well, full size. This is half the image. There's another half, and we can uh, scroll between the two. And this image, every uh, single little dot that you can sort of uh, imagine is there is not a star, it's a galaxy. And this is data they work with every day, except they do it in their office with a 17-inch monitor. Uh, they have satellites that uh, have been, you know, 10 year, 20 years project that they finally put in the sky as the Planck satellite, sends 4,000 by 4,000 pixel images every 10 seconds in 10 bandwidth, 10, 10 waves, 10 bandwidth. Uh, again, they store them and they haven't figured out how to look at them, what to do with them. Other example is chemistry and biology. Very complex molecules, as you can imagine. The one on the left is in fact running under PyMol, which is a, an open source uh, molecule visualizer system. And with the software we've created, we can run it on the wall and you can turn uh, the molecule and do all the things you do in PyMol in terms of visualization in real time um, on, on the wall uh, with the system running on the cluster I showed below, but before. Neuroanatomists, uh, they're not interested in big images. Uh, they have high resolution scans of brains, but they're interested in comparing those brains. And they told us, you know, I want to have 500 brains displayed and be able to look at them and, uh, and rearrange them to compare them directly and figure out which are have a pathology and, and which are fine. And so here, the size of the display is useful for um, comparison. And what came out of working with these uh, scientists and uh, starting to understand their need is that the large surfaces, like the wall, were not necessarily uh, for displaying large images. And in fact, when they are there to display large images, uh, they still need to navigate with things like panning and zooming. This image we see on the left, which uh, is an, uh, uh, an assemblage of images by the Spitzer satellite of the center of our galaxy, the full resolution image is 400,000 pixels wide. And they need to work with all of it. That's 20 times the size of our wall. So we have an image of Paris that is 27 gigapixels. If you take all of Google Earth, uh, I, it's, it's, it's a few petapixels. So you know when they want full wall images, uh, it's still not enough, uh, and they will still need to navigate in, in those large images. Oftentimes, what they want to do is compare uh, homogeneous data, like these brain scans. These are all different brains. They look very similar to you and me, but they are different. Uh, even more often, they want to aggregate heterogeneous data. Uh, a brain scan, some DNA sequence, uh, data pulled out of a gene bank, uh, papers pulled out of, uh, of various databases or from Google Scholar, and they want to put all this together and discuss it in, in small groups. And the last thing they want to do, and they all want to do it, is to say, well, these environments are great, but how do I bring in my colleague who's working you know, at Stanford or Cambridge or somewhere else? So how do I communicate remotely and collaborate uh, remotely? And this is something we're not covering yet, although uh, we have a project in that area. So we work with them. Uh, not only to understand their needs, but to create the solutions. And so we do participatory design workshops, um, like uh, this one, where we play, we act out interaction techniques. So here it's, it's using the Wizard of Oz technique. Someone in the back of the room is, uh, is controlling this web page, and I'm playing with, you know, how do we scroll this uh, with a, a simulated handheld device? Do I want to scroll up or scroll down? How does this work? We do the 2D version, well, pan and zoom version here with uh, uh, controlling Google Earth on, on my iPhone and uh, 
uh, pretending that it's uh, controlling the full size version. And uh, I'll skip to the end here. Uh, here is another way. In fact, we found that this pinching gesture was not very efficient in this kind of mid hair environment, but doing a physical tracking for panning and zooming uh, was a lot more natural. Uh, and of course, because we track the position of the devices in 3D, we can do that. And then we have our own take on the, uh, a pick and drop, which is the shovel. So you go on the table, you uh, gather the stuff you're interested in, you go to the wall, and then you throw it on the wall. And that's uh, the kind of interaction we, we, we can support. And the thing is, we worked with, uh, th this is a, a session of within ourselves, but when we work with scientists, they spontaneously come up with these types of, of, of interaction. And so the notion of, of multi-surface interaction is natural to them. Uh, we don't tell them, we're going to do multi-surface interaction now. Tell us what, uh, uh, what you think. Uh, we let them imagine things. And for example, the neuroanatomist came up. Um, what they need is to control these brains in 3D. And one of them pulled out of his bag uh, a 3D model of a brain. And it turned out to be uh, a printout of his own brain. He had gone into the MRI and had <laughs> a 3D print of his brain. So he's walking around with his brain in his, uh, in his bag. Uh, doesn't like other people to touch it. Um, and then he said, well, I want to hold this and turn it in, in 3D and have the brains on the, on the screen turn in parallel. And of course, uh, Ken Hinckley had done that back in 93. Uh, but it was uh, interesting to see that they spontaneously came up with this type of interaction. So in multi-surface interaction, the way we see it is uh, this notion of instruments that move, edit content seam seamlessly across surfaces. So at the bottom, we have the shovel interaction I showed before. Uh, on the right, we have interactive paper. People want to write on paper and uh, be able to annotate things on the wall uh, or on the table uh, uh, with paper annotations. Uh, in the middle, we want to be able to use, for example, the table as a sort of a sorting area for what's on the wall. And all of this can be interpreted in this context of multi-surface interaction and, uh, and, and instruments, um, generic instruments for the environment. And we also want to let users come in the room, plug in their laptop, whatever that means, and uh, be able to seamlessly transfer content to the, to the various surfaces from their own laptop. So we've created a, a small uh, video here, which is acted out. So it's a bit wooden, but it's uh, the current system uh, as it works. So here we see uh, Clemens uh, using the table as a staging area for the wall. So he's using uh, images that the astrophysicists actually use uh, for real. Um, and then um, these images can be picked up by James here, who's using a, a, an iPod touch as a sort of a laser pointer. And there is a little interface on the iPod touch, so you can move or resize, as we'll see uh, in, in a little bit. And to bring content to the wall, we have various content providers. So one of them is, interestingly, email. We have a Gmail account for the wall uh, and a, a program that monitors that, that email account. And when something arrives, uh, it takes really long time to write this email, so I'll skip this part. So uh, as soon as it detects the, the document attached to an email, it throws it on the wall, and someone can pick it up and, and drag it uh, uh, in this, in this uh, environment. So here we see that he's uh, using the same device to, to scale. Since these are PDF documents, they scale at full resolution on the, on the, on the wall. Now, here he's brought a, a web window on his laptop and is sharing that uh, a snapshot of that window. Uh, so that's from an unmodified laptop. So anybody who brings uh, their laptop to the, to the room could do that. Now, with a little bit more software, we can also transfer live windows from, from a Mac machine. So here, we've put it on the table. We've changed the uh, uh, configuration so that the table is adjacent to the wall. So I slide things from and to the wall. And as he interacts with that uh, web page, in that case, on his uh, laptop, the, the one on the wall is updated in real time. We could also interact with the, the version on the wall directly. And here is our... Um, a fake physicist, <laughs> uh, Fanis, who is uh, pretending to write a, a, an equation on paper with the Anoto pen. Uh, and uh, again, the same idea is that you can write annotation. Uh, he's going to put the pen down on the, on the cradle, uh, and the document is going to uh, show up on the, on the wall. 
So this is a, a, an acted video, but it all comes out from uh, 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 these uh, sessions with, uh, with scientists uh, and the kind of thing they would like to do is in this environment to, to work. And that's their real data that they And that's uh, some of their real documents. And it's not necessarily uh, uh, critically difficult to implement. But what's important is how seamless it has to be for them to be able to use it. And here's another example where we're grabbing a photo and sending it uh, over, over email. So when we work with those scientists, we understand the type of uh, interaction they would like to have for the environment. We also we realize that we need to reinvent everything. Uh, pointing at data on the wall, you're not going to do it with a mouse on the table. Uh, navigating documents uh, because of the size, it's probably not going to be the same thing as, as we do today on laptops. Uh, menu selection, window management, all these basic tasks that we have refined in the GUI environment have to be reinvented uh, and redefined in this environment. So we've done a little bit on the, on the elementary parts of this, uh, pointing and navigation. When pointing, for example, um, given the size, so the maximum amplitude, and the uh, resolution, which defines the smallest target you want to point at, plus the fact that even if these were touch screens, you still want to be able to point at the distance, because sometimes I'm going to be standing far away and I want to highlight a particular uh, element of the, of the wall, we need better than laser pointing. Laser pointing just doesn't work, or at least we haven't been able to make it work. So we created a set of uh, uh, dual... Uh, yes. Uh, well, technically it works, but you don't get the accuracy you need. So if you want to, uh, so in the video here, I think we have something that shows, so this is uh, uh, Manhattan, and uh, we're going to zoom in so you can see the, the sort of kind of resolution you get on, on the wall. And at the distance where he's standing, which is approximately like here to the wall, you cannot uh, control the, the laser pointing to, to, to point at a uh, uh, target of this, size that you want to be able to point at. So what we've created is dual, mo du dual mo mode pointing techniques where you have a coarse technique to approach the target, which is laser pointing. And then you have to enter a mode, which is a little bit cumbersome, to adjust that, 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 that pointing. Uh, and we tested various uh, techniques. And we can select targets that are, uh, uh, I think, under 4 millimeters, uh, which is two or three times as, as uh, better than that when what was done before. Uh, but it's still a little bit problematic that you have this mode switching. But we tried the gyroscopic mouse where you play with the acceleration like you do uh, on, on, on the laptop. But we couldn't get to, to, to the, to, well, we couldn't get the right curve. Maybe someone can do better. But uh, we couldn't solve it with a single mode technique. The paper that was presented last week at CHI and was one of the uh, best, uh, best papers, best of Kai papers, uh, looked at panning and zooming. And here, uh, what they did, because I uh, <laughs> was not directly involved in the work, so, um, but Wendy was, uh, is compare 12 interaction techniques by looking at three a design space built around three factors. So the first one is, do you want to use one hand or two hands? Pan and zoom, we know it works well to do you know, panning with one hand, zooming with the other, uh, usually zooming with a non-dominant hand. Uh, then there is the question of, do you want linear gestures or circular gestures? And since you're navigating large uh, ranges, circular is appealing because uh, you don't have to do the clutching that you need when, when you do with the mouse on, on, the, on the table. Uh, the third dimension is, do you want freehand gestures or do you want gestures that are guided either on a 2D surface, like a handheld device, or even with a 1D uh, device like the, the scroll wheel and the mouse. So I can't give you the whole uh, uh, results, but it turns out of these 12 techniques, two came out uh, as, as the top techniques. One here we see is bimanual uh, linear motions uh, using a Turi surface. So you can see your hand on the left doing zooming with one hand and the right hand doing um, uh, the, pa the panning. Now, the interesting, uh, this went too fast. Uh, oops. The sorry. So I'll play it again because it went fast. So bimanual linear 
to the surface. So on, with the right hand, she's panning, and with the left hand, she's controlling zoom uh, on, on, on the iPod. Now, a little bit less good in terms of performance, but uh, the advantage of work with one hand is you do these two tasks, panning and zooming, with one hand using uh, two areas on, on the uh, handheld surface, one for panning, one for zooming, which means you have to do it sequentially, but it still performs better than most other techniques. Things that work, don't work well at all is the type of freehand interaction that we see in movies. So here's unimanual circular motion with 3D uh, uh, freehand. Uh, she's holding a, a device, but, uh, and, and you know, this is the kind of thing you see in, in Hollywood. The users love that in terms of, you know, it's cool. I can, you know, pretend I'm uh, uh, Tom Cruise, but the data says it's more tiring, it's less accurate, uh, and, um, and it doesn't work as well. So I don't think we have the final story on this, but we have explored these techniques, and, and we know the different trade-offs and the thing that could be explored further and those that uh, are more problematic. Um, the last section on the, uh, of the talk here is going to be on the software. So, you know, we're working with users to understand the type of interaction they, they, they want to, to use in this environment. We do basic research on things like pointing navigation, and uh, next will come things like uh, selecting uh, in menus or, or this type of elementary task. And then we do the engineering of, you know, how can we build uh, an environment, a software environment, that uh, makes it easy to develop applications for, for this type of, uh, of system. Now, typically in our um, setup, we have 16 computers driving the wall. We have uh, two front-end computers in front of, the, of this cluster. We have a computer driving the Vicon tracking system. We have a computer in the table. We have each of the handheld device is a computer itself. So we have 20, 25 uh, computers. Every laptop that someone brings it is an extra computer. And to create the seamless experience I was talking about, we need to develop uh, distributed applications for this environment. So one thing that worked very, very well for us was uh, this notion of replicating the full application uh, at each node of the wall. And this is very different from what everybody else apparently is doing uh, on these large walls, which is to use some kind of variant of an OpenGL a uh, backend that, that will uh, sort of pipeline the, the rendering on the cluster in a way that is transparent uh, to the application. So I don't know if you know things like Chromium or Equalizer uh, uh, or CGLX, uh, a number of these things. Uh, the reason this didn't work for us is first, we don't want to rewrite applications from scratch and our approach allows us to reuse legacy application. Uh, second, it doesn't work well as well for, for interaction. So I will show you the types of things we've developed. First, we have something that we call the wild input server. And here the issue is we want to be able to easily reconfigure the interaction in the environment. Uh, we buy a new gyroscopic mouse. We want to be able to try it and to plug it in uh, in existing applications. So we want to extract the sort of uh, uh, low level of, of interaction processing of, of low level events outside of the application. So we use a, a system that was developed by someone in the group a few years back called ICON, the Input Configurator, which uses this visual language uh, of blocks that you connect together. It's not unlike MaxMSP for those who know these types of uh, uh, data uh, driven languages. The nice thing is that it is visual, uh, it is interactive, I can change the, this diagram at runtime, and we do it uh, very often when we have these participatory design sessions to try different things. And so what this gives us is, is the notion of uh, uh, logical devices, uh, which are built up from uh, uh, hardware devices. For example, the iPod Touch we, we use as a laser pointer and as a sort of a, uh, input input device itself. In fact, at the hardware level, it's two devices. We have the gesture tracker, the, the motion tracker, and we have the, the, the iPod. Um, for the application, it's one device that it's it ha it's an you know it, it's an iPod that happens to to know its position in space. So using these these blocks, we can present the application with this abstraction of a pointing device in 3D. 
Uh, and when you're developing uh, your software, you can do this at home or in your office. You don't need the wall. You can replace the, the Vicon tracker by, uh, well, we've done it with the Wii. Uh, it could be a Kinect. And when we get into the room, we just change the configuration and it works. And so this has really uh, been a key in the flexibility we have in, in redefining and, and reconfiguring interaction uh, on, the on the fly. Then we have a, a rendering engine called uh, Zoomable uh, uh, interface, uh, User Interface Toolkit, ZVTM, uh, which was developed by uh, Emmanuel Pietriga on the picture here, and ported to the wall. And the way we do this is we run uh, the system 16 times, one time per computer, or sometimes 32 times, one time per screen. And um, there is a, a front end uh, to the application that just synchronizes those uh, 16 or 32 replicas. Each replica has uh, its own camera on the part of the scene it's showing. And by doing the really simplest uh, uh, possible uh, thing, we have extremely good performance. And we've done this for this uh, toolkit. We've done it for the PyMol system I showed before for visualizing molecules. Uh, we've done it with software from the physicist that I'm not allowed to show. So we've done it time and again, and it works very well. And then uh, we've developed uh, uh, Substance, which is uh, something a bit more ambitious, I would say, where we're trying to develop an infrastructure for uh, developing full application in this environment where you can easily add and remove parts of the application as it runs. So I gave a paper at CHI uh, last week. Uh, some of you were, were there. I don't have time to, to get into the details here. But we have a data model, a data-oriented programming model. So on these various devices, we create these trees of data. And then we attach functionality on these trees. And we have a way of sharing these trees among different computers through uh, either replication or mounting. And it gives us an extremely flexible environment. And the video, the long video I showed before, was, uh, was created uh, using, using Substance. And, and we use it now uh, routinely. And also, Substance directly implements the notion of instrument that uh, I've, uh, I've introduced at the beginning of the talk. So um, another application we created with Substance is called Substance Grise, which is French for gray matter, uh, which is a software that our um, uh, neuroanatomists uh, really wanted to have. And we display 64 brain scans, so two per screen, and we use their application called Anatomist, which is a complex application for 3D visualization of these. Thank you. And now what? Um, so uh, for 3D visualization of those brains, and we didn't want to rewrite it. So what we did is we wrap their application inside our substance middleware. And what we are able to do is something like this where we have this uh, plastic brain that is tracked in 3D, uh, and its uh, position uh, directly controls the 64 uh, brains displayed on all the screen. And as you see, it's very smooth and, uh, and real-time interaction. Now, there are issues with the control with the brain, because of course, you have to stay steady if you want to <laughs> uh, uh, the display not to move. So we need a clutching mechanism. But this application was developed very easily within this environment. And so unlike uh, any other system I know to run on, on walls like this, we, we can use legacy application without uh, reprogramming, reprogramming them. So lessons. At the hardware level, we were able to put together a platform with off-the-shelf components uh, and still very flexible. We focus on interaction uh, and collaboration, uh, not on the graphics rendering. Uh, we engage with real users through participatory design. Uh, we try to understand the affordances of the platform and uh, use the interac instrumental interaction model to create a, a unified uh, uh, interaction in, in, in this context. We discovered that people like to use personal devices to interact with this uh, shared data. And we build software from scratch. Uh, we're being lazy by putting a lot of computing power so we don't have to, to do too much work ourselves and uh, uh, wait for Moore's Law to, to do the work for us. Uh, and using little tricks like the OSC protocol as very efficient glue to create these uh, loosely coupled distributed applications. Um, 
one aspect I didn't cover is this notion of collaboration. If you remember, there was a slide with four uh, images, and the last on the right was communicate. And time and again, these users, as other potential users of these uh, rooms, come to us and say, well, but I want to share this with my colleagues at the distance. And so uh, we just uh, uh, got a grant from the French government that I'm coordinating. It's a $30 million uh, project to create nine rooms similar to this wild room. Not all the same. Some are uh, immersive caves, some are 3D walls, some are multi-touch walls. We want them to be different because we think if this technology uh, really becomes real, not everybody will have the exact same configuration, like not everybody is using the same type of laptop today. Um, so we are going to build these nine rooms, and they will be interconnected with a high-end uh, audio video system, and we'll study remote collaboration and try to scale up from a single room to uh, a network of rooms. And that's the end of my talk, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so are any of the scientists that you've worked with, have they actually been using the system for their daily work? Uh, we haven't reached the uh, phase where it can be used for daily work. Uh, so there are, there are a couple of issues. Um, first is the data they work with uh, is uh, not for everybody's eyes. So uh, it, it, it stunned me that, you know, I thought the skies was everybody's, but uh, <laughs> the images they have from these satellites, they cannot share. They cannot share uh, with other labs. So there has been an issue uh, about this. Uh, the second thing is, you know, it's just been a, a few months where uh, since the, the system has been stable enough that you could, you know, leave them the key and, and work for, uh, for a day at a time in there. Uh, the third thing is that we ourselves are using the, <laughs> this environment almost uh, uh, all the time. And part of this Digiscope project that I mentioned at the end that will be that these rooms will be more accessible to outside users. Um, so we're... What? So we'll end up having two walls. One so, for example, in our lab, we'll have two walls, and one will be more for our research, and the other more for outside users. So we are not quite there yet, uh, but I have to say I've been quite uh, pleasantly surprised that they were uh, that they spent so much time with us, and they were so so willing to to come to the lab and try things out and, and do these sessions. So they're really interested, uh, and they also see this as a technology that is affordable for them. Um, so, for example, the physicists who are working with the Large Hadron Collider and all of these massive things, they come in and they say, oh, $200,000 for one of those walls? Yeah, we'll put that into our free cash budget. I mean, they're really mm -hmm. in a different scale than we are in terms of funding. But then if you talk to the biologists, they're not at that level. So, um, and there's also questions of um, where they physically work. So in some cases, you know, if they're uh, two miles away, that's close, but it's not close enough to walk over and just use the room. So one of the things that the, we do, yeah. we're getting a new building and we'll be closer to them. And so there's all those questions. There's another thing that we haven't, uh, we're, we're not supporting well enough yet, is we, we made great efforts so that it was easy for them to bring their data into the environment, as, as the video was uh, sort of illustrating. But the question they asked is, OK, so what do I get at the end of the session? How do I get stuff out? And that's something that we need to, to think about to make it uh, really uh, usable on a more regular basis by them. So I have two questions. I don't know who went first. So. <laughs> I'm just going to build on that. So OK. Is that it, it, it says a lot of these systems are amazing when you're in them, and it's a great experience. But it sort of gets on to this topic of the physicists come and they do something. But has it crossed the threshold where they're going to demand this as their method of Using uh, these displays to, to, to visualize the data that they've got. And I, you, so I know it's early, but do you ever feel for when you cross that, that magic threshold? When you see how uh, some of these scientists have come to, to the room, have seen their own data, like the astrophysicists, like the biologists with the molecules, uh, they were like kids in a candy store. And so they immediately see how not only it's, it's just useful to them and cool, but how it could change their practices of doing research. 
I have a concrete example of a, 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 a different project that was done in, in another country in France with uh, archaeologists. And all they were using at the time was the big wall, uh, you know, the silicon graphics, uh, what was it, the reality, uh, what do they call it, this reality engine things, you know, high-end projectors and, and, and the semi-immersive walls. And it completely changed their practice of doing archaeology research. What they would do is they bring all the archaeologists, archaeologists who had worked on a given site in the world, bring them into this room for two or three days for a workshop, you know, or for a week, put together all the data they had collected on that site, and then uh, collaborate and discuss like they were not able to do before. And what I, I, I see uh, clearly is that this will have similar effects for some of the scientists, maybe not all of them, but certainly for, for the biologists, the neuro, neuroanatomists, and, and for the astrophysicists, it, it's pretty, pretty clear to me. You wanted to add something, Wendy? I wanted Wendy? to add something to that and sort of make a more global comment, which is that um, we're funded by the French government. We don't have any commercial acts to grind. And in fact, our charter, if you will, is to do things that are great for French people, great for Europeans, and great for the world sort of in that order, but, you know, it helps the world, that's great. And one of the things that comes from the first part of the talk, um, so this is really two talks that Michelle gave. One is about the wall and all that cool stuff, and the other is this concept of instrumental interaction. And I don't know if it's clear to you how radically different that is than what is sort of out there right now. Right now, everybody is tied to Microsoft and that kind of application. The idea is interaction <coughs> is evolved from the graphical user interface on a machine like that. I mean, they used to be bigger, now they're smaller, but the idea is you get this application in one silo, this application in another, this one in another. They don't talk to each other. You've got your data tied to this one, and if Microsoft changes the format, that's too bad for you. Or if they change the way you interact with it, that's too bad for you. We're saying, end of that. What you want is data some kind of format to your data, and instruments which allow you to manipulate that. And those instruments could come from that device. I'm sure somebody's got an iPhone or a, an uh, iPad or a big wall or a table or whatever. The idea is that you extract the interaction from the data. Once you do that, then you're in a whole different world. And then it goes back to your laptop because it has radical implications for how you deal with doing stuff on your laptop and how, as well as in these walls. And what's interesting giving this talk at Google is that if I were at Microsoft, I'd be scared to death. And if I were at Google, I'd be like, yay, because that's this kind of model. You know, you're all about data and how to get to it. You haven't been about interaction. Frankly, Google sucks at interaction. Sorry, but that's the way it is. But this doesn't suck at really interaction. This is how you deal with interaction with lots of different types of data in different kinds of environments. So it's kind of like, Michelle is French. She's far more modest than I am. I'm an American. I can talk like this. But it, it's really a whole different way of thinking about how you deal with interaction and data. And, and we've, we've got real world people who are extreme users and we're trying to push it. But there's, this is not a, another interaction technique. So, okay, so <laughs> if I take in order, I had <laughs> the back there, then here and here. If you're familiar with the Hyperwall project, it's oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd be well. interested in, you know, it seems like your architecture is a bit different than theirs. I was wondering if you can, you know, maybe comment on what they did right and what they did wrong. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is they did right. They had a wall, they have a wall that we've seen. <laughs> it, it's, it's twice as big, so it's really impressive. But to interact with it, the last time we were there, there was a computer in the back. You had to be, you know, at a table using a mouse to, to, to move, uh, to put anything on the wall, turning your back to the wall. Now, we, um, with the wall that is in San Diego, which is the, sort of the same as in UCI, uh, we are collaborating with uh, uh, Jim Holland's group uh, at, at UCSD, and as we speak, we have a student from Paris who's visiting them this week and is going to install some of this software there. Um, I think what the projects at San Diego, UCI, but uh, also Stuart Chicago and the University of Texas is one, all these large walls have been driven by people who come from 
scientific visualization and themselves coming from heavy duty computer graphics. And it's all about the graphics rendering. And then they realize, oh, how are we going to interact with this? And I think their architecture uh, for the rendering is not appropriate for the type of things we want to do. And they don't seem, at least up until now, to pay much attention to interaction. The people who do pay attention to interaction in, in these environments are the Ravin Balakrishnan's group in Toronto, uh, um, is it Chris North, uh, uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech, uh, maybe one or, or two others. But in, in these uh, other projects, uh, we tried to use CGLX. Uh, we looked at uh, another software that's called, um, um, uh, it starts with an S. Uh, it's not, um, anyway. And, and they are really designed so you create a whole application from scratch uh, for, for the environment. And I don't think this is really the main problem here. There's enough graphics power so you can do things in a silly way like we do, and it works. So. The other thing is we, we were just talking with Jim Holland like three weeks ago, and what he said is that they don't get users. They get demos, but they don't get real users. We actually get real users. We haven't got real users using it on a day-to-day -day basis because we have access problems. But there is no question that they absolutely want it and need it for their real. They can walk in with their data and do useful things at the start. That is not true. Oh, all they can do on the big walls is look at really huge images, which is nice, but it's not. Possible. Well, they, they do in, in Chicago. They do. There's this uh, network. Uh, it's called uh, the Opti Portals. They do use it a bit for um, uh, uh, teaching, uh, so using the wall in front of a classroom with sometime a, a remote participant. But interaction there is really slideshow-like, so it's, it's very limited. Uh, I would like to uh, have you talk a little bit about the tangible um, interaction. Uh, I, last time I was working in that domain, uh, I kind of left it with the problem that there's no doubt that physical artifacts are great to interact with, but uh, they you will need a lot of them. And, and I'm sort of reminded about the Gulliver's travel with uh, in one of the countries and people, the philo philosophers were, were walking around with sacks of objects so that they could <laughs> show them. And, and sometimes I had the feeling that that was what we were proposing. Like it's cute to have the brain, and but but what's what's the next thing? And then you have a heart, and then you uh, how can you how can you find few items, few artifacts that are actually powerful without going all the way down in reduction in reduction into a pen and a mouse. Well. I'm not sure this is so much of a problem. I mean, again, in this picture, look at the number of tools he has. You know, he has scissors, he has pens, he has rulers, he has all these things. Yeah, but so it, has taken, <coughs> it has taken hundreds of years to get to that set of tools. And, right. and I think that we need to work hard on figuring out which tools might have enough properties to be actually useful in more than one Right. Class. And my answer to this is that a key aspect of this notion of instrumental interaction is this polymorphism, is make it so you can design a tool that is independent of the object uh, uh, it, it is interacting with. So you have a very loose coupling between the two. And for example, we have a move instrument. We have several move instruments, in fact. We have one on the table. We have one in this handheld device. All it needs to know is whether the object you are targeting has either a method to say move, so the object is aware that it can move, or you can also make it more risky, saying, well, if the object has an x, y position, maybe I can you know, directly modify these and see what happens, which is what we do in the real world all the time. We use, you know, you use a, a, a screwdriver to open your can of paint. You use uh, your knife instead of the screwdriver. So, you know, you, you, you discover those natural affordances. And what we want to do here is to do this at the software level. And doing this decoupling between the instruments and the, the objects, the data, the content, whatever you want to call it, I think is, is key. Uh, 
there will be a scalability issue. But you know, I think if we solve the problem of uh, this decoupling and, and support this polymorphism of being able to use an instrument with various objects, even though the objects were not necessarily designed to be used by this instrument, then uh, we can address the scalability uh, problem if it comes up. But I would like to have this, the, the problem of too many tools. Uh, we're not at this state yet because everything is so sort of, as when he was saying, you know, uh, uh, inside silos and, and, and very uh, constrained. So, uh, and the other thing is, I think you have to relate to the work practices uh, of, of, of your users. And if we provide a flexible enough uh, infrastructure, so when the guy pulls a brain out of his, uh, uh, of his bag, you can say, oh yeah, let's uh, stick three markers on it and make it your instrument. Uh, then I think we can adapt uh, also the, the instruments to the, to the specific needs. And so I always say that instrumental interaction is both a combination of some very generic instruments, navigation, selection, uh, pointing, etc., and very specialized ones for you know, power users. And I think this is the way it works out in the real world. So, so uh, we had Jimmy. Okay. I don't know if I answered your, <laughs> your question. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I was just going to kind of respond to what you were talking about a little bit before that relative question, which is, you know, I, I, I actually was at Microsoft before here. And yeah. The trouble actually in here, the trouble isn't actually that they aren't aware of this vision, is that the problem, uh, in fact, I was actually impressed by the number of product people that shared this idea of, oh, we could, wish we could move material between all our displays. The trouble is that there's, once you get to the brass tacks of actually how to come up with a scalable, practical solution, infrastructure that could actually do this, it becomes very, very difficult. And there hasn't been quite, uh, like one, of, one of the frustrations I have somewhat with the academic work in this space is that they make a lot of good demos, but there's actually very little concrete, like huge proposals for actual infrastructure that could actually be adopted at scale. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons why doing this in France is radically different than doing it in the US. Because in the US, you've got the university system where you have a professor and in graduate students, and then you have it. We have a, a group of eight faculty and a bunch of you know, people and engineers and so on working with us, and we do larger scale projects. So the CPN project that he was showing is a full scale working application that, that uses this idea. And then the environment that we're talking about here, um, I mean, as, as Michelle said, we just got a $30 million grant right, right, to go in great. and, and build this, and goes. we're working with a bunch of partners on uh, yeah. I think people, I mean, really, I don't think people have tried hard enough. And, and I think, no, no, but I think in, in the sense of saying, you know, let's start with a clean slate. Um, Dan Olson gave a, a very nice keynote at WIST a, a couple of years back, uh, saying, you know, don't try to get your thing to be compatible with uh, Microsoft Word or these things. You know, try from, from scratch. This is exactly what, what Xerox did with, uh, with the star. And you know, these days, anything you publish at Kai, if it's not an app that everybody can download and play with at the end of the talk, it's sort of not you know, of interest. Uh, there's more, uh, in a sense, there's more creativity in the hardware side because people understand that if you're playing with fancy new technology, not everybody can have it. But in the software side, it, it's, it's, it's very Im um, impaired by this notion that it has to be compatible with what's out there. Hey, so, I which is, I agree that you have to rewrite the software to do well, but rewriting the software has been done several times, almost since his talk, which includes iPhone, iPad, Wii, Connect. I mean, all of those have had mass amounts of software rewrite. Because yeah, the but within the different. same, uh, at least for, for, for mobile devices, within the same uh, general framework of essentially the GUI, just scaling down to the right size and adjusting the widgets here and there but not the vision of uh, uh, seamless interaction. I mean, there's nothing in iOS, in Android, in macOS, uh, in Windows to support this kind of, of uh, um, uh, multi-device interaction. Which is that when we first started working in this area, the world was all about applications. And it was really hard to feel, figure out that you could do anything else. And then the web comes in, and you've got that playing a very Role, although it, the level of interaction could be limited. But, and then you get the App Store and that, and all of a sudden now we've got three different models of how you 
build software, and suddenly now it's an open question again, whereas it was a little bit. I mean, I envision, you know, uh, uh, an environment where you can buy instruments the way you buy apps today. You know, if someone comes up with a nifty, I mean, we, we're teaching a class at Stanford where we are uh, exploring this, these ideas uh, with students, um, and um, and one of our guinea pig is is the color picker, uh, and you know, if someone wants to come up with a uh, niftier color picker, why is it today I cannot use it uh, instead of the standard one? Uh, I mean, within the application, I'm not saying going to a web page that has a web app. But why can't I change the color picker in, in, in Word and, and uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Photoshop to use a different one? And this is what this is about. And to do this, you need to get these things outside the app itself. And then once you've done that, you are in a completely different economic model for software, where you don't sell you know, big bundles uh, that do everything, but it, it's, it's more going to the store and buying you know, the pen and the, and the brush that you like. Now, I, I don't know, I'm not a businessman, I'm not sure <laughs> how to make this work, and maybe it's too late to have this kind of uh, revolution happen. But I think, as Wendy said, we're in a position in research where this is what we should be trying at least. Yang and Shumin. Okay. So uh, first, I totally agree uh, we should basically uh, shift the focus from uh, application-centric to uh, uh, activity or data-centric design. So, but I still see a general discussion here regarding uh, gener uh, generality and the specificity uh, of a tool, to, uh, tools, right? So on one hand, we want to really tailor <coughs> tools for specific activities, right? So, uh, so we can be effective. And on the other hand, we want to, uh, to design tools in you know, uh, general tools. So humans are very good at uh, uh, using tools in different situations for different purposes. So I'm just wondering what's your take on these two arguments? I, I think they're not incompatible. And it's certainly uh, the case they're not incompatible in the real world. You know, if you are a graphic designer, you're going to be very picky about the exact pen and brush and this and that you're using, and you're going to go for a specialized tool. If you are a kid in kindergarten, you don't have the same level of, or, or if you have, you know. So I think I see an ecology of instruments, of tools, where you have some general purpose ones that are pretty good at what they do, but, but you know, and then you will have specialized one. And me, the user, will be able to pick. Now, there's a, an aspect of this which when you could give a talk about, which is this notion of learning and co-adaptivity how once I got a tool, I can make it work better for me through <coughs> configuring and adapting the tool and the tool learning from me and, and this kind of thing, which uh, we've worked on these things as well. So I think we have the opportunity in software to make tools that sort of uh, uh, support this transition from journal use to more expert use. Uh, but, but I think to start with, you can have generic tools, general tools, as well as specialized ones. I don't see anything um, uh, strange in, in this because it's again what, what we do in the real world. It's more or less the same uh, question or issue. That is, the notion of instrument is really interesting, um, but you still see the general tension between uh, naturalness, if you will, or direct manipulation versus uh, something more powerful but less direct. Uh, with more transfor transformations in the middle. Uh, among all the tools you demonstrated, uh, the uh, replica of a physical model seems to be most intuitive that anybody can relate to, but it's also uh, probably least powerful because it only fits that one particular task. And as you can see, once you start using it, you realize actually it's not that good because you have jitter, you have it's not stable, you may need a clutch, once you add a clutch, it's already not so direct, and, and, and so on and so forth. Imagine uh, you know, people drive complex vehicles. Instead of using indirect controls, they actually use a replica of, of their model itself. It would be actually uh, not all that powerful. So this uh, tension between direct manipulation or very intuitive affordances versus uh, more powerful tools continue to be a challenge. I, I 
completely agree it continues to be a challenge and I don't think you know this is uh, just saying this is an instrument solves that problem um, I think I think you have this notion of mediation and and I think it's important to recognize that you have mediation and that mediation can be you know uh, sort of simple like in the case of the, of the uh, plastic brain or can be more complicated and you have a more sophisticated uh, instrument uh, I mean, if you take the example of searching things on Google, you know, the, the search box on the Google main page is a searching instrument. Uh, and it's, it's very simple, except that if you want to use it in a powerful way, you have to learn all the syntax that you can use. Now, what I envision is that, you know, people could have better interfaces for, for, for this search box, uh, so you wouldn't have to learn this, this syntax. The, the interface for navigating the results is also very poor in Google's case. It's, it's page after page after page. Well, now in some cases you can scroll. But I think you can add, I think the problem with the tool metaphor is that if you take it too literally, you only think in terms of pens and, and rulers. But you have instruments that are complicated. Uh, uh, the, the driving a car is a complicated instrument uh, with a lot of indirection between you know, what you do with a steering wheel or with a throttle and, you know, what it does in the end. What makes it work is that you can understand it with a simple mental model. So I think the whole challenge of HCI in general is to hide the complexity and make complex things simple. And that's certainly true of instruments as, it's, as it is of, of, of other approaches. Um, but I see Wendy yeah, really I wants to <laughs> say something I different. That, yeah, I want to say something different, which is one of the reasons want to have instruments is because you want to develop expertise. And you gave a wonderful talk not too long ago, a few months ago at Stanford where you talked about this very precisely. There's the walk up and oh I can swoosh that and it goes up on the wall and isn't that wonderful? And it is truly wonderful. But think about, so when I was little I learned how to play the violin and I pity my poor parents who had to listen to me for the first several years playing the violin because it's not something you can walk up to and just play. You have to learn. But once you've learned, you can make wonderful noises. Um, and the whole idea of making it worthwhile for people to learn how to use instruments and become expert over time, the only way that makes any sense is if instruments are separate from whatever random version of whatever piece of software that Microsoft has <coughs> given you, or Adobe, or I'm not I'm sounding very anti but, but, but the idea is that you, the other piece of, of, that's wonderful about this idea of instruments is that they're incrementally learnable and that you should be able to develop expertise. If I'm a touch typist, I want to have that ability transfer everywhere I type. I don't want to have it just touch type this way here and touch type that way there, which is precisely, I mean, I know you know this point because you made a, a really wonderful talk about it, but I just, I'm, I'm sort of like, just want to yeah. make sure that, that, that you, I mean, no, I mean the, 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 part of what we're talking the about. The learning and the uh, ability to embody expertise and to have tools that uh, encourage virtuosity, I think is very important. Um, you know, one of the things that was, that I liked the most at the CHI conference was none of the talks and the new, new research that I saw. Uh, I didn't see many. I didn't see many of them. But it's the talks by, uh, by Stu Card. Uh, by um, uh, Terry Vinograd, by Larry Tesler, by Bill Buxton, all of them had to do with historical perspective on the research they, they've each done. And, and if you go back to Engelbart, Engelbart was really against the idea of things that are easy to use. Because all the things, the powerful things we do in the world require training, require expertise, we require virtuosity. And so we want to encourage people to develop this virtuosity and, and not pretend everything has to be easy like uh, uh, a four-year-old can do it. So I think, I think in the HCI world, we've sort of been uh, lying by saying we can make things easy. I don't think easy is the right, is the right take on it. Uh, it. It's giving more power to the users to do things that are, uh, on the contrary, a lot more powerful. Uh, but through metaphors and, and, uh, and uh, affordances that uh, m make it uh, natural more than easy, I would say. Is the question there?
So, so in fact, it seems to me that um, we have an existing approximation to, to this world in computer music. Um, so on my laptop, uh, you have an Apple. There are some audio units that come with it. There are software modules that make sound. You can play directly on the, on the keyboard of the laptop, and you're done. Or you can get yourself a proper synthesizer keyboard. You can plug that in. You have more expression in the input. You can get various processing boxes, which masquerade as hardware, even though they're really software. And you can plug those into the signal chain, and it just works. Um, you can get really complex, highly remappable uh, software controllers. You can get um, wind controllers. You can get um, whatever you want. You can plug those in. Or you can go the other direction. You can plug in an electric guitar, and you can make that work. Right. Um, so. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Been there, seen there, done that. So I was wondering if you could tell us what's different about what you're thinking from this model, which to some of us is already familiar. Um, Apply it outside of music. Yeah, I, th I think. Uh, so it's simply that the music people are like a decade ahead of the rest of us? Uh, I. Not well, <laughs> I, think, I think to some extent there is some truth to that. And it's been driven by the fact that. Uh, musicians have seen the value of using computers while wanting to retain a lot of the uh, uh, expertise they have with physical instruments. And a lot of the work in computer music has been to turn uh, traditional instruments, whether the piano or whatever, into first media devices and, and, and transducers. Uh, and that's not just for uh, performance music, but also uh, the, 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 the mixing consoles and, and all these devices, where musicians really understand the, the importance of the physical aspect of interaction. And I, I think what, what um, and, and you get this to some extent where, you know, I can plug any USB mouse in my laptop and it's going to work. So we have a lot of this in, in the hardware side of input devices, uh, but it doesn't translate as soon as you go into software. And I guess this is what we're trying to, to get at. I should at. mention that we're working with musicians. Yeah, One Wendy's. Piece uh, of it, uh, we work with Yepcam in Paris, and we're just making connections while we're here with uh, Karma at Stanford and Siena at, um, at Berkeley. And, and it, it really is related to this idea that this notion of instrumental interaction really resonates, if I may use that word, with these guys. And so a lot of the things that we're trying to do uh, it's, it's, it's looking at that. But they don't follow all the way through it with that in their composition process, for example. They're better at that model when they're dealing with performance. performance. We're working with them on the composition process. And so there's a whole, that's a whole other talk, which would be yeah. a talk I would give them. So we're Bob and she's here. Stop here because we have a <laughs> really quick question. Okay. Clock, and you can take the uh, questions off that. And Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> well, we can go. Thank you. Thank you.